Hi everyone, this is Kendrick at worldmedicalschool.org. We're going to talk about bronchiolitis. So this affects about 1.65 million kids every year that get hospitalized and a lot more that don't. Luckily we are getting pretty good at keeping kids alive and uh, preventing the respiratory distress and respiratory failure that used to cause deaths due to RSV and bronchiolitis. So what is this? We Sometimes we just call it an RSV infection because that's the major cause of it, but it's not the only cause. Um, really what the definition is of bronchiolitis is inflammation of the bronchioles. And the clinical definition is usually just the first episode of wheezing with an infection under the age of two. That's not pneumonia. So Clinically, we don't uh, we don't actually assess if the bronchioles are inflamed. We just uh, we just assume they are if the kids are wheezing and they don't have pneumonia. So the major car causes uh, R RSV is the ma number one cause, but your regular rhinovirus, uh, paroinfluenza, uh, human metanumovirus, influenza, coronavirus. So if you'll notice, rhinovirus, parainfluenza virus, these are our common upper airway uh, infection causes. And so you can see that it's, uh, it's more of uh, a diagnosis of where we're infected and not exactly what disease is infecting the, the system here. So uh, the bronchioles are are down here uh, right before uh, we get to the alveoli. In fact, there's uh, sections called respiratory bronchioles that are actually connected to the alveoli. Then after that, then you get your bronchioles and then your bronchi. And then, of course, the trachea, uh, the larynx, the pharynx, the mouth. So uh, the bronchioles constrict down because they're inflamed and they're already kind of small so you get that wheezing sound. We're going to talk about these uh, the wheezing and the other symptoms that you get here. So the story that you'll hear is this child under the age of two um, has a upper respiratory infection where they have runny nose, maybe some cough, uh, sneezing for a couple days and then they have this low-grade fever a little bit higher fever if it's caused by adenovirus. They um, and then they start to get this uh, shortness of breath, sometimes apnea. Uh, I think it's around 20% end up presenting with apnea. But wheezing is really the key feature here. And uh, then recurrent cough can happen for a couple weeks after the infection is already kind of clearing up. You'll see this with the common cold too. So it uh, sometimes you can just have this this inflammation that hangs on and causes a cough to keep going for a few weeks. On exam, they're going to be breathing uh, quickly. In a lot of instances, you'll hear this wheeze. Uh, usually, it's going to be an uh, expiratory wheeze, and uh, in cases where they're in respiratory distress, then you get this intercostal retractions hyperexpansion of the chest and uh, here's a little uh, sample of the of a wheeze not necessarily so that's not necessarily a uh, RSV patient or a bronchiolitis patient we're talking about here because that sounds like it's a inspiratory and expiratory wheeze but that's, that's a little bit uh, what the wheeze sounds like that one kind of sounded like it had some uh, like alien noises in the background. I don't know exactly where that was recorded. Um, but the major complications, like we mentioned, are respiratory failure. That's where you get those 500 deaths a year that we mentioned. Or uh, you get a bacterial superinfection that leads to pneumonia, bacteremia, meningitis. For those of you who saw the asthma video, we went into a little bit of detail about whether or not RSV really causes or is associated with asthma. Well, we know that the numbers uh, sh show an association, but uh, one theory would be that kids who wheeze with RSV infection 
are just the same kids who get asthma, um, not because the uh, RSV caused the asthma, but it just shows a tendency to wheeze. So the jury's still out on that one. The differential diagnosis uh, includes asthma, but really we don't diagnose asthma under the age of two. And so most of these kids are, uh, most of the time we're calling the, this bronchiolitis under the age of two. Pneumonia um, can have wheezing, but usually you're going to hear some, some lung crackles. You're going to have signs of pleural effusion. So if you're good with the stethoscope, you probably can tell the difference between a pneumonia um, and uh, bronchiolitis. Uh, also with pneumonia, we, uh, we tend to have uh, more obvious uh, signs on radiograph, which we'll talk about in a second. So some chronic lung diseases, um, both congenital and acquired, can look like this. Foreign bodies can cause wheezes. One big thing to look for there is asymmetry. We remember that uh, things are more likely to go down that right uh, right bronchus, and uh, therefore you're you're more likely to have uh, a wheeze on the right side. Um, GERD with aspiration, heart disease. I don't know how I spelled that one. Uh, can also have some some lung sounds, vascular rings, upper respiratory infection. So really, what differentiates this from a re upper respiratory lesion is the wheezing. So, I mean, we talked about it, it's the same viruses that's going to cause it. You know, rhinovirus, adenovirus, um, and then potentially RSV can cause up upper respiratory infection too. Um, but the wheezing is going to be the big difference, and that's going to tell you that the inflammation is down there deep in the bronchioles. Uh, croup, uh, which is laryngotracheal bronch uh, bronchitis, that's just going to be a little bit higher up too. You don't get the wheezing, you get that seal-like bark. And then, of course, uh, pneumonia is an infection that gets down clear into the alveoli. So, uh, We've got upper respiratory infections, we've got uh, croup, we've got uh, bronchiolitis, and then we've got pneumonia as you get farther down in there. So the diagnosis is really clinical. We do have tests to test for RSV, and we can also do x-rays. But the RSV testing may serve in some cases to uh, decide whether or not we are going to uh, use a, a ribavirin, which we'll talk about in a second. They may also discourage us from using antibiotics, which one could argue is a good thing. But in general, we don't need to test for RSV. Um, X-rays are generally just used to rule out pneumonia. But once we get our X-ray, we might notice that we get we have atelectasis, and that will help us to d determine how severe this. Uh, bronchiolitis is. So when we're talking about severity, this is going to be a big factor in how we treat it. So if uh, the baby is premature, if they have com comorbidities including heart disease, especially immunodeficiency disorders, uh, that's going to make this a severe case. If the kid looks toxic, looks real sick, uh, if they have uh, low O2 saturation, um, if they're under three months of age and they have atelectasis like we mentioned, that's uh, going to put them in the severe category and going to change the way we treat it a little bit. So normally we're just going to treat this supportively. There's, there's no uh, drugs that we're going to use in most cases. Um, we discourage any over-the-counter use. Uh, over-the-counter drugs, uh, fluids are important. A lot of people, I, I guess uh, from what it seems like, most people uh, will prescribe uh, albuterol in a nebulizer for uh, bronchiolitis, which I think there's pretty good evidence that it um, improves the symptoms, 
but uh, no real evidence that it changes the course of the disease. So um, one rule that you should follow, though, is if you give albuterol and it doesn't help, then stop giving it. Because uh, if it doesn't help, then we're giving, um, a, giving a drug that we don't need to give. Um, in the severe cases, like we talked about on the last, last page, uh, those with comorbidities, those with low O2, uh, toxic, uh, a toxic look, uh, these kids can be hospitalized, should be hospitalized, put in contact isolation. Oh, that's another reason we might test for RSV, by the way. If, uh, if we find out that they have RSV, that might help us uh, to, um, help, might help us to divide up our patients and, and not cross-contaminate cross-contaminate. Um, ribavirin is pretty uh, uh, widely contested uh, whether or not it's a, an important thing to do. But we go back to the severity. If, the, if there is a severe condition and we do have a positive RSV test, then ribavirin can, in some sort of circumstances, shorten the course of the disease. But there's no good evidence that it uh, it uh, prevents any long-term complications. We can also do some RSV prophylaxis during the winter mo months, uh, especially for some of the hospitalized kids with uh, heart conditions and uh, immunodeficiency conditions that would make them more likely to, to get RSV. So uh, thanks for uh, Dr. James Heilman for providing his uh, x-ray that uh, showed us some atelectasis in RSV and thanks to Dr. Henry Gray for his uh, wonderful drawings that we've been using for the last hundred years or so and if you would like to volunteer one of the first things that you can do is leave a comment if you found any errors or anything that should be added to this video uh, next thing that would be a great uh, help would be to write a practice question that tests your classmates or others on the content of this video. So uh, just one, one quiz question that uh, tests on an important point of the video and leave that in the comments. Or if you'd like to write multiple questions, that would be even more helpful. And uh, share the link with others or go to worldmedicalschool.org backslash volunteer. Thanks. We'll talk to you soon.